Okay. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was uh, an introduction which was extremely useful because it saves me putting out a, a, a high level of context uh, before I ask uh, uh, Director Clapper my first question. Uh, but thanks for coming out tonight and, and, provide, and thanks to the university for providing this venue. I've spent a, a few happy hours watching some very happy people in this hall and um, I, I think we'll be a little more reflective than is usually the case in, uh, at graduation ceremonies and the like. But it's a privilege for me to be here with Jim Clapper. Uh, I spent six years in the embassy in Washington and, and I have to say there are people that you came to appreciate very much when you're an ambassador. And I guess there was nobody in the US I appreciated more than Jim Clapper. We always put down various arguments as to why the Ameri alliance we have with the United States is in our national interests. And the starting point is almost invariably the fact that it gives us a high level of uh, vision of what is happening around the globe, both uh, in terms of sight and also in terms of audibility. And that gives us a level of confidence that we can properly plan for our security and diplomacy in this region and more globally. So our ability to collaborate with the American intelligence community is critical and, and Jim Clapper led it. Uh, we're going to talk tonight, as, as, as the Vice-Chancellor has said, about a whole array of, of issues that uh, arise in contemporary terms. Uh, we'll be talking about the, the current administration, folk in the administration, where that's leading us in terms of ongoing crises that are in our area. But I thought I'd start uh, by asking uh, the director, how does the United States see Australia? What, what is the, what it, when you look at an ally here, what, what is there of value to you? Well, I, it's hard, uh, uh, Kim, to overstate uh, the importance of Australia to uh, the United States. And I guess uh, <clears throat> uh, before I get into that too much, I ought to uh, just address briefly why, do, why does Australia, the United States, or any nation enter into an alliance? And quintessentially, it's, uh, or essentially, it's because it is in the mutual best interests of uh, the respective parties to that alliance. And so in our case, uh, by that I mean the United States and Australia, it is in our mutual best interest to have that alliance. Now, my uh, purview, obviously, is, has been intelligence. And uh, I first came to uh, Australia in 1984, and in any number of in intelligence incumbencies uh, since then have grown to appreciate the importance that uh, Australia, important position that Australia occupies in the larger scheme of, of intelligence things. Can't go into a lot of detail in, in a setting like this. But I've also seen it and have, I like to think, helped expand the breadth and depth of that uh, relationship. And it is today uh, flourishing. And that's just one aspect, one pillar of, of that alliance. Obviously, the the military uh, relationship, the diplomatic relationship, uh, are, uh, the, and the economic uh, relationship, all of which I think are among the pillars that make this uh, arrangement and this alliance so important to us. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't hurt at the same time that we have, we share, I think, uh, values uh, and, a, and a heritage uh, together. That draws, us, that draws us ever closer. And there's a long association uh, in a military context between uh, our two countries. When I uh, departed my position as uh, DNI, the Prime Minister Turnbull uh, gave me a memento among, I, I received a lot, but none meant more to me than the memento that the Prime Minister gave me uh, of the statuette replicating the iconic picture of an Australian soldier carrying over his shoulder a wounded American soldier in New Caledonia in 1942. It's a great 
uh, symbol of our alliance. And again, I, I will say from an intelligence perspective, we derive mutual benefit from that. Australia is a huge contributor uh, to a global perspective, not just here regionally, but thanks to our joint activities together, Australia is a major player in a, in a global context in, in that intelligence relationship. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I just wanted to set that up uh, in, uh, in context so that folk had a bit of an understanding about how you were situated with regard to us and, and, and what was important to you uh, in the, uh, your interests in being engaged as well as our interests in being engaged with you. But I think what's on the mind of just about everybody here is a bit more contemporary than the, the, the history that underpins that. And that is responding to um, the impact on, on re regional relations, on the bilateral relationship, on, uh, on American politics of the, uh, the election to President of Donald Trump. And um, he, he has come as, shall we say, a surprise package. In, uh, in, in many features of his, uh, both of his presentation and his personality. And uh, I just wondered if you could uh, give us a bit of an idea, we'll talk a bit more than just one question on this, and I'm, I'm sure others will have questions too, but um, the impact you see him having on what you might call the traditional national security community of the United States. How does he, is, is he perceived by and related to uh, what we've come to respect enormously of the quality of the uh, intelligence community, uh, the national security community more broadly defined with the Pentagon and the like? Uh, you've had things to say about that publicly and I wondered if you care to discuss them here. Well, clearly uh, President Trump is, uh, shall I say, unconventional. Um, mm -hmm. Never quite had a, a president, certainly in my experience, uh, quite like uh, he is. He, he comes to the position uh, uh, rather unfamiliar with uh, the government and how it works and uh, what the, at least the classical roles of uh, a president have been. And certainly, uh, I think the first time he was ever exposed to any classified information or the intelligence community was during, uh, once he became the nominee and as, as is customary, we start to brief both of the principal nominees uh, before the election. And certainly after he became the president-elect, uh, those briefings and indoctrinations became uh, more intensive. Um, he, um, of course, uh, was very skeptical about the intelligence community assessment that we produced uh, and published on January 6th, recounting the uh, extensive and egregious Russian interference in our political process. Um, I think he took great exception to it, principally because he was very sensitive about anything or anyone that que would question the legitimacy of his election or the veracity of it. And so that assessment uh, represented uh, a challenge, I guess, uh, to him. So it resulted in his character characterizing uh, the intelligence community as uh, Nazis, uh, which uh, none of us appreciated very much. Um, <laughs> And I had occasion to uh, call him uh, about it, and he uh, amazingly uh, took my call. And um, I tried to appeal to his uh, higher instincts about what uh, national asset that he was inheriting uh, the, the U.S. intelligence community uh, is. Um, I may have rendered uh, a great service by departing. Uh, since uh, it since replaced uh, two of the principals, uh, John Brennan, director of CIA, and myself, and uh, in, a, in I think a very regrettable manner replaced uh, a great public, a distinguished public servant, Jim Comey, and we were three of the four people that briefed him at Trump Tower on the sixth of January about uh, about that report. So that's uh, just kind of up close and personal, 
uh, my own encounters with him, which I, I have to say weren't, uh, weren't real positive. Uh, I think, as indicated in the introduction, I've worked for every president, one in the, toiled in the trenches of intelligence for every president since, including John F. Kennedy. I've been a political appointee in both Republican and Democratic administrations. I spent 34 years in the military. Uh, so my natural instincts are uh, loyalty uh, for the president, particularly in his capacity as commander-in-chief. And this, this is the uh, first time I've ever had uh, occasion to uh, question that. I think um, that uh, my impressions here, after being here for a week, is that perhaps there's too much preoccupation with uh, some of the things he says, um, as, and particularly with respect to the, the impact on the alliance and the, the pillars of that alliance, as uh, I indicated, I think are uh, much more transcendent, much more permanent uh, than uh, the transient occupant of the White House. And I think people uh, get overwrought uh, about that. I will say, in uh, fairness to President Trump, that I had the uh, honor and privilege of attending the uh, anniversary, the 75th, uh, the uh, 75th anniversary of the Battle of Coral Sea in uh, New York City, and President Trump was there with uh, Prime Minister Turnbull, and it struck me that he was clearly on a mission to mend fences. Um, he gave an excellent speech. This was a teleprompter-type speech, which is much, I much prefer the teleprompter President Trump than the <laughs> tweeting President Trump. And uh, uh, I think he uh, said all the right things, said and did all the right things, and also acknowledged the importance uh, of the alliance. Um, but in the end, you know, Australia must, must do what it needs to do in, the, in its best national interest. And I trust and hope that Australia will see that there is still tremendous value uh, in that relationship because of these pillars, whether it's mm. military, intelligence, uh, uh, economic or diplomatic or, or whatever. Uh, our two countries, in my view, are just inextricably bound. And I think those deep, long-lasting, pervasive relationships will sustain uh, will be sustained and will not be all that, that affected by uh, some of the utterances that come out of the White House. Yeah, it's a point that I, I think that's a, a very worthwhile point to make. If you, you, you can look at the, the alliance in, in a couple of layers. There's a layer now, really since the 1960s, more than the 1950s or even 40s, of intense military engagement in terms of supply of equipment, quality equipment, uh, embedded uh, personnel, the intelligence area we've already discussed, now investment. I mean, the last time we have figures, it's about 860 uh, billion American investment in Australia in all areas of the economy, increasing in that year, 2015, by 80 billion, which is more than the total stock of Chinese investment, for example, at 75 billion. But even more important now for us is Australian investment in the US, which now stands at 600 billion. And the earnings of Australian companies in the United States are four times the value of Australian exports to the United States. I mean, these are, th this is a totally different relationship now from what it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. But that's, that's that level. The other, but the level of uh, officialdom, you know, the exchange that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis between a president and a prime minister, while not the, not the basis of the alliance, is often what actually gets the attention of the public more than the underlying mm. reality. And I was just thinking, you, you did make mention of it. We are not really familiar here because it's not very much within our gaze. The, the character of the relationship with Russia. Um, but that is, of course, at the centre of, of the current investigations and, uh, and concerns that uh, are afflicting Congress and the broader American public. What impact do you think 
and it's hard to make a judgment about this, but from your, your seat of the pants assessment, what, what impact do you think that the various activities identified as of Russian origin had on the outcome of the election? Well, that's, that's a key question. And uh, uh, I, we, the intelligence community, could not make a call on that. Uh, we, didn't ha we don't have the authority, the capability, the expertise to assess what was the impact on the electorate uh, of the uh, Russian ma machinations. Um, it's my belief that it had to have had impact uh, when you consider the magnitude of what they did. You know, the Russians have a long track record of interfering in elections, theirs and other people's. And we have uh, documentation on the Russian attempts to influence our elections going back to the 60s. Uh, but never, ever had we ever seen anything like this that was as aggressive and multi-dimensional as this one was. So in addition to the infamous hacking of the uh, Democratic uh, uh, National Committee, there were uh, an intensive campaign to, to promulgate fake news by the Russians, which many uh, other news outlets in the United States either wittingly or, or unwittingly picked up and, and thus amplified Social media trolls, those who were paid to implant uh, false social media items, which many of which went viral. A very intensive and sophisticated and slick uh, propaganda campaign by RT, the uh, Russian television network, which is predominantly funded by the Russian government. And there's a close connection between the chief executive of RT Network and uh, President Putin. So this was a very aggressive uh, campaign, but we couldn't actually say empirically what effect uh, it, it had on the, uh, on the election itself. I, intuitively, it had to have. The only thing we said in our assessment was that we saw no evidence of uh, messing with uh, voter tally uh, voter tallies or, or counting votes in any of the 50 states. We didn't see any uh, evidence of that. I think the other point is that, of course, the Russians must be very pleased, must be very gratified with the results because uh, our assessment was their first objective was to sow discord, dis, you know, disruption, doubt, in our political system, and, and they certainly succeeded in that to a fairly well. Secondarily, there was very strong animus, uh, personal animus, against Hillary Clinton by Putin himself. Uh, he held, uh, in fact, he had great animus towards both Clintons, former President Clinton and, and former Secretary Clinton. And in her case, held her responsible for what he felt was an attempted color revolution in 2011 to uh, bring about regime change, in other words, get rid of him. So very strong animus towards the Clintons. And then as the campaign wore on and where it appeared that there might be a chance for uh, uh, then the candidate Trump to become president like Trump, um, they started getting him bored. And of course their preference uh, would it be for someone like him who was a businessman, somebody they thought they could negotiate with, and someone who, who would not be uh, uh, pushing hard on, on uh, human rights, for example. Um, even in the later stages of, of the campaign where the polls indicated that uh, Secretary Clinton was, was going to win, and their objectives then turned to how to undermine a potential Clinton presidency. So they were kind of, uh, they were uh, innovative and creative and agile as, as the campaign wore on. They, they just looked for opportunities to take advantage of it. And as Director Comey, former Director Comey indicated in his uh, hearing before the Senate Intelligence Committee, they'll be back. They're going to, on the heels of their success here, they are emboldened to be even more aggressive. And so I think we can look forward to attempted interference in our election process as a standard feature uh, of Russian behavior. The, um, 
But carrying uh, the Russian point a bit further, one of the interesting comments I saw assigned to Secretary Tillerson uh, when he was out here for the recent Osmin meeting, uh, he was said to have uh, remarked to Australian officials that really uh, the President was continually suggesting to him that he, he hoped he would find ways of building a better relationship with Russia uh, as a primary objective. It's, it's interesting, I mean, I, I, not a lot of Australians realise that the Russian economy is the same size as the Australian economy. Uh, ours is going up and theirs is going down. And, um, it, it, but with that, and with the population that has to be supported by it, they've got really quite an extraordinary outreach. Uh, much of it, some of it's legacy, of course, from a different era. Mm -hmm. The Soviet bloc used to be about 7% of GDP. I think Russia is uh, a bit under 2% of GDP now. But uh, the Soviet bloc, of course, was a bigger <coughs> entity. But uh, looking at, 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 at the sort of uh, threat that they might pose or the, um, the beyond just the, the politically interfering threat, um, what do you see as the main developments in their capability uh, that uh, means they can sustain that level of potency, if you like, in, in uh, global strategic uh, uh, issue? Uh, you, you did mention a few items of kit that they focused on and, and how they behaved on the border. Perhaps you might just elaborate a little on that. Well, for one, they, of course, the Russians have uh, shown that they uh, can leverage uh, a particular capability of theirs that uh, goes back to you know, the Soviet era. My own view is if, if you're looking, if you're sitting in Putin's chair looking out long term for Russia, the prospects aren't all that great. Um, starting with the demographics, population is actually shrinking uh, over time, and of course that, if that has impact on the number of uh, military-aged males that are available. They have challenges with respect to uh, life expectancy, high infant mortality rates, an AIDS epidemic, high rates of alcoholism, and of course, importantly, an economy that is disproportionately dependent on one commodity, which is oil. And as the price of oil uh, fluctuates, that has direct impact on uh, their economy. And when they uh, program a budget, say $50 a barrel of oil, uh, and it's only $35, that has huge impact on, on, long, on the long-term health of their economy. They have tremendous infrastructure challenges. It would be very difficult for the Russians to wage a two-front war, say both in fo the Far East and in Europe because of their uh, underdeveloped uh, infrastructure. Nevertheless, the Russians have embarked on a very aggressive and, for my money, disturbing modernization of their strategic nuclear weapons, notably uh, a, a new generation of uh, land mobile intercontinental ballistic missiles and a new generation of submarines carrying sea launch ballistic missiles long range. And by the way, uh, just for good measure, they're also an active violation of the INF Treaty. Uh, so uh, I, I heard the, kind of the same sort of expression of interest on the part of President, at the time President-elect Trump about uh, wouldn't it be great if we could have a better relationship with Russia? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose it would. But uh, the Russians are not interested, in my view, in a positive relationship with the, with the West and certainly not with the United States. They are, inter they are, they, they are a global competitor. Uh, they want to do as much as they can to undermine our system, which uh, the leadership doesn't, doesn't, is opposed to, they see as a threat to them. So Russians are not our friends. And uh, if we can find areas of agreement where our interests converge, great. But um, as Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify. Okay. I'd like to bring things a little bit closer to home, not much closer to home, because I want to talk about, uh, get your views on the Korean Peninsula and perhaps settlements of, uh, 
uh, the issues of, the, of uh, the nuclear weapons capability of, uh, of North Korea. It, it, it does seem that one issue has exercised uh, really quite a high level of focus on the part of the new president. He is, uh, it, it was said to, to me that Barack Obama said this is going to be your main problem and that he actually does accept intelligence briefings on it and tries to have a conversation about it. He drew a red line. The red line, which I always think is a very dangerous thing to draw politically, internationally, unless you actually really intend to follow through by a crossing of the red line, you're going to punch someone's head off. So it's an, an active red line, not just a, uh, a notional red line. So therefore, one ought to be careful about using red lines. However, the red line that he established was on a, a capability which at the moment North Korea does not have, uh, and that is an ICBM. So he said, no ICBM. It does seem to me that if this is going to be uh, incapable of being resolved by Chinese diplomacy, which I so strongly suspect it won't be, um, that maybe there's something there for a, a sort of freeze or a, a, a halt to advancing that, uh, that particular capability in return for uh, other things. It need to be a fig leaf about non-proliferation, at least because the Koreans have already made commitments about nuclear weapons. I just want to wonder what your perspective of, on Korea was. Are, are we getting it right? Should we be somewhere else? Well, uh, I do have a, uh, a uh, somewhat, I guess, uh, contrarian or un unconventional view on uh, what to do about North Korea. Uh, my interest uh, there began when I first served there in the mid-'80s as the uh, Director of Intelligence for U.S. Forces Korea, and I've sort of followed developments on the peninsula uh, ever since, and uh, one of the things, as a consequence, uh, one of my items on my uh, bucket list uh, was someday to visit uh, North Korea. And I got to do that in uh, November 2014 in, uh, in the course of retrieving two of our citizens who were at the time uh, imprisoned under hard labor conditions. And uh, I remember uh, parenthetically the one of the nicest things the New York Times ever said about me was uh, rhetorically asking, why on earth would you send a DNI, the head spy in the United States, on a delicate diplomatic missions, mission like this to North Korea, especially this DNI? And the uh, New York Times diagnosis for that was, uh, well, he's gruff, blunt, a relic of the Cold War, ideal for North Korea. <laughs> and, uh, always appreciated that. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, when I went and uh, engaged with uh, some, I uh, uh, did not meet with Kim Jong-un, but uh, uh, engaged with some North Korean elite leaders, I was uh, blown away with the degree of paranoia and the siege mentality that uh, prevails uh, in Pyongyang. And as they look out, all they see are uh, enemies. And so my first uh, authorized talking point that I was given was that uh, you, you must denuclearize before we can uh, have dialogue with you. Well, that is, I came away, that's a non-starter. North Koreans are not going to give up their nuclear weapons. And oh, by the way, neither they nor we know if they'll work. But it doesn't matter because they have uh, created what they want, which is deterrence and respect, which they crave, and international recognition uh, as a nuclear power. So point one is they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, they went to school on Gaddafi, and uh, he gave up his weapons of mass destruction, and things didn't turn out so well for him. And they, they, uh, they, they took that on. Secondly, um, the Chinese are and this is based on some, you know, dialogue I've had with them, they're probably as frustrated with the North Koreans as everyone else is. They don't like the missiles, the missile tests. They don't like the underground nuclear uh, uh, tests. They don't like all the saber rattling and all that. Um, but the Chinese like, dislike even more is the notion of losing their buffer state. 
Uh, so they'll, they'll put pressure on the, my belief is they will put pressure on the North Koreans to a point, but not so much that they, they would cause the regime to collapse. Because what they, they want even, uh, they oppose even more would be a unified peninsula, obviously under the control of Seoul, and then to have that on their border along the Yellow River, backed by the United States, is complete anathema to the Chinese. So they will, they will pressure, they will leverage, but only to a point. And third, it's my personal opinion that the United States really doesn't have any viable military options. If we were to preemptively attack uh, Yongbyon, the uh, nuclear research facility, for example, or one of the uh, KN-08 uh, ICBM sites, uh, without a any deliberation on the North Koreans' part, it would reflexively, they would turn loose all that artillery lined up along the DMZ against Seoul, a metropolitan area of about 25 million people, which has a lot of Americans there too, I'd like to remind folks. And, that would ha and they would, uh, as they've threatened on more than one occasion, transform Seoul into a sea of fire. So my view is, and this is uh, clearly not company policy, I can assure you, <laughs> is that uh, given all, the, all the, this, these facts, in my view, we, the U.S., along with our, uh, would have to get, gain the cooperation and support of the Republic of Korea allies, I think we should consider establishing a, an intersection in Pyongyang, not unlike the intersection we had in Havana, Cuba, in representation of another government we didn't recognize, but at least it afforded a presence and a conduit for communication. And there's, I think, great advantage to this. One would be the, just the physical presence there, which would uh, pay dividends from an intelligence perspective. We won't go into detail there. But maybe even more important is a conduit for information, information from the outside world, which the North Korean regime uh, fears. And that would open up some dialogue. We ought to, in the, while we're doing that, we should uh, uh, sustain as much prever pr pressure as we can, particularly financial. The North Koreans go to great lengths to finance their activities illicitly through front companies and the like. They have very complex uh, financial mechanisms to generate revenue, and we ought to continue to work on, on that to try to pressure them. But I think uh, further isolating the North Koreans, demonizing them even more, uh, threatening major, major conflict, or, or sending an armada someplace, is uh, all, all that sort of thing does is heighten that paranoia and that, uh, that siege mentality. Well, look, now I, I think the audience may appreciate, but you've just heard a revolutionary statement, and uh, that is not the direction necessarily that policy is being pursued, but nevertheless is an interesting perspective. And That's what's so great about being out of the government. <laughs> And, and that is a, and, and that's a, a sort of product of uh, how valuable the uh, intense study you make of a country or a system uh, when you are a long-serving intelligence uh, officer. Now, that's, uh, I, I'm, I've been getting a signal that the time has come for us to receive questions from the audience, and I understand that the Vice-Chancellor has got a, a bunch of them. And uh, they keep them flowing in, and we'll uh, we started a bit late, so we'll probably finish a bit late, and um, be very happy to take the uh, to take the questions that you've got, Vice Chancellor. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions. We're obviously not going to be able to get to all of them, but uh, we have some very interesting ones. Our first question is: Australia's intelligence community has grown substantially over the last decade to meet the new challenges of the 21st century. Do you think there are any aspects of the American intelligence system that Australia would benefit from? For example, a director of national intelligence or a homeland department. And likewise, could the U.S. system reproduce any strengths of the Australian model, such as 
the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security? Well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I will, I'll have to do the, uh, the dutiful statement about my reluctance to inject myself in Australian internal issues, but <laughs> <coughs> since you asked, <laughs> Uh, I did have some uh, dialogue with uh, uh, Steve Merchant, and uh, who's an old, old uh, colleague and friend, and uh, Michael Lestrange, who were uh, conduct have conducted the uh, uh, intelligence review, which I think is in the final throes of uh, preparation. Um, and uh, obviously, the topic of the conversation with me is: uh, is there uh, an application here for a DNI-like? arrangement um, for Australia. And uh, I said, oh, well, there, that's a possibility. Um, the, uh, well, one other point I should make before I, f I finish that discourse is that the only reason we have a DNI, the position I occupied for six and a half years, is because of a very traumatic uh, thing for the United States, which was the 9-11 attacks. Were it not for an external stimulus like that, no one in the intelligence community, most of all our CIA, would have ever voted to have, let's have a DNI. So uh, the major changes like that in our system have been occasioned by some traumatic uh, event where there was a perception of failure. Uh, and there hasn't been that uh, situation here in uh, Australia. Uh, you have, uh, in my humble view, a very, very capable intelligence establishment, and Australian citizens should take great pride in the confidence and professionalism of uh, the Australian intelligence community, which, uh, as I indicated earlier, punches way, way above its weight in terms of impact with us and uh, particularly in, the, in the, the, the Commonwealth, the Five Eyes uh, Alliance. I do think there is merit in having uh, a body or, or somebody who can look at intelligence as an enterprise and decide on a systematic, routinized basis where to make investments and where to make divestments. And I think that, that is, is one of the strengths of, uh, in our system, the DNI who can look at the entirety of the enterprise and try to decide on an objective basis where must we invest, where might we take risk. And that enterprise view, I think, does have merit. Uh, and something, another area that is kind of mundane, not very sexy, but this is on IT, which is uh, the nervous system for uh, an intelligence enterprise. And can there be consistencies, efficiencies and consistencies there? We're, we are moving towards that in our system. Would not have happened without uh, the presence of a DNI. In our system, at least, there does need to be a champion for integration, collaboration, coordination. And it, ha it has to be on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and on a systematic basis. So to the extent that any of those attributes would be appealing, uh, then that, you know, but in the end, Australia has to make its own decisions and not necessarily emulate what uh, the United States has done. Thank you. All right, uh, next question I think both of you could uh, take a stab at. What do you think happens after the Trump presidency? Will America continue its America first isolationist approach or will there be a return to a globally re-engaged America? What do you think, Kim? <laughs> well, look, <laughs> firstly, um, uh, good question. Uh, isolationist is not the right word. Unilateralist is the right word. Uh, Trump is not an isolationist, but he is uh, displaying tendencies of a unilateralist. That is uh, heavily focused on the idea that there is an American interest that is actually distinguishable from that of a broader community, broader Western community or broader global community. And that American national interest will be pursued in the first instance. And being pursued in the first instance, it's likely have to, to have to be accompanied if a, a power is to be used 
by a unilateral exercise of that power. I, I do think, I, I do fear that, uh, that the uh, advent of the Trump administration has taken off the table a number of aspects of American foreign policy which, uh, though often mocked and often produced, and produce uh, for arguments of those who find elements of the policy objectionable, a lot of criticism and a suggestion of hypocrisy. But nevertheless, and, and, and they I must say a set of values which is a, a, a defence minister who considered himself a power realist often found uncomfortable uh, in exercising it and therefore not very appreciative of it myself. But there was and has been the case since really since World War II. The United States has had injected into the global political system a, a set of concepts and values which actually are important for basic decencies in the system as a whole and in individual countries. The Americans do elevate human rights issues. The Americans do elevate uh, liberal democracies. The Americans have uh, instigated a rules-based order in relation to uh, trade, uh, in relation to uh, global economic exchange. There is a, a, a sense for uh, the United States that there's a set of values that they pursue, which while they may be shared in the United States, go more broadly than the US. And having those sentiments, it undoubtedly underpinned the way in which Americans saw their responsibilities to other people, including ourselves. Americans used to like to say that they thought that Australians were rather like them. I always used to say, we're nothing like you. So you are uh, idealist and you're optimist. We are pragmatic pessimists. <laughs> that is why we have a... Uh, uh, you, 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 we follow you in many ways out of idle curiosity. <laughs> and the... Um, as to where all that is, uh, that is going to actually uh, take us. But the problem with this administration, it's taken... And as I said earlier in the introductory remarks to it, um, having put up that, that paradigm that I just did, you know, there's, there's a multiplicity of political forces in a multiplicity of countries which would deny that any reasonable assessment of those standards were being properly met by the United States or anyone else. Uh, people are full of schadenfreude when they come to, to look at things that uh, uh, the United States impacts on. But nevertheless, there was a basic decency out there. And the thing that worries me about the current administration is that it's essentially taken that out of the equation and has moved to an essentially mechanistic exchange base um, process of bilateral and multilateral relations. What's engaged in here is not a higher principle, but an exchange of interests. And I think that it will be possible for the United States to move back from that, but it's going to be hard because other people are moving to fill the gap and introduce into the international relationships other principles that don't necessarily relate to that. And having abandoned it for a few years and then getting back to it is not going to be that easy for the US when that occurs. I think, uh, I mean, that's a great, it is a key question. <clears throat> and uh, it's somewhat of an imponderable, is, you know, what, what's going to happen in our political system. It, it's, uh, you know, it's all, it, you can just watch the daily drama, you know, you can't make this stuff up. It's all, some new wrinkle every day, so <laughs> hard to say. I do think, though, that um, the uh, imperative of globalization, which is already upon us, is going to be very difficult to reverse. And some, sometimes the rhetoric I hear uh, from the administration is, is as though it could be. Um, and bearing in mind, of course, that the president is playing to uh, his base, which is into this uh, notion of America first and uh, we can't but be bothered with the rest of the world because uh, we have all these uh, issues at home and we've got to bring back coal or some other absurd proposition. Um, 
So uh, I just think the, uh, the uh, imperatives of globalization and the pressure of globalization is, cannot be reversed. I think what, uh, frankly, the president is, is encountering as he actually engages with, with uh, uh, countries is the, the, the difficulty of uh, extracting the United States, isolating the United States. Uh, that it's almost uh, uh, can't be done. I do think there's a, a valid concern that, uh, and I'm, I agree with Kim here, is this uh, sort of uh, one-off transactional approach to foreign relations. Uh, how long that, you know, how long, it, the, how long that, it, that is sustained and how much permanent damage that could uh, um, cause uh, what has been, uh, you know, U the U.S.'s traditional role since uh, World War II. Um, there are those in the country, uh, to include uh, many Republicans I've, I've encountered, who uh, believe, maybe, uh, t uh, maybe optimistically, that uh, what we're going through now will serve as a cathartic and that once we get past it, we've had very difficult interludes in our history before, uh, and then you know, came together. Uh, probably the most dramatic, dr dramatic example was our, our Civil War, which was a terrible time for the country, tore it asunder, and it eventually re reunited and was probably stronger for it. And whether we'll go through some uh, epoch like that, in, in this case, I, I think uh, remains to be seen. I do take great stock in uh, what Kim says, who probably understands uh, the United States better than a lot of Americans. And so I, uh, that's why I wanted to hear what he had to say first. <laughs> Great. So uh, China has not been a fleet power since the emperor disbanded China's fleets in 1433, but has now bought a secondhand aircraft carrier from the Ukraine and will have its first home-built carrier operational by 2020 with two more to follow. Given the millions China has spent on dock facilities in Darwin, Fiji, and elsewhere, is China's growing ability to project force into the Pacific and the Indian Oceans uh, a new normal, and what does it mean for Australia, especially if the United States becomes more isolationist? Well, I'm glad uh, you're going to buy some new submarines. <laughs> uh, I think what China is doing is uh, really uh, it shouldn't be viewed necessarily with uh, panic. Um, they're a power, uh, a major power in the world, and I think an accoutrement of that is, uh, uh, you know, their military and certainly uh, they're a maritime nation. And it's not unreasonable that they would uh, want to project uh, a maritime power. Uh, I have a lot more hope in uh, a beneficial, positive, mutually positive relationship with the Chinese than I, I am the Russians. And if uh, their, uh, their uh, military abilities can be channeled the right way, that could be a uh, you know, force for good. Uh, I do think it, 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 it underlines the importance of the United States continuing to be uh, a maritime presence in the Pacific. And we certainly would look to uh, Australia uh, to be there with us, as you always have been. All right. Um, I think this will be our last question. Uh, we talked, you talked a fair bit today about the uh, interference in the U.S. election. We didn't talk about what lessons that Australia can take from the U.S. experience about foreign interference and our dem democratic processes, especially in this new digital age that we're in? Well, I think one of the most important things uh, we in the U.S. intelligence community uh, could do and, and did do, which is why we wanted to put out an unclassified version uh, of our intelligence community assessment. In fact, President Obama uh, directed us to do that when he tasked, tasked us the first week of December 
to put everything together we possibly could at whatever classification levels we needed, but also to get a, to share with the next administration and with the Congress and to the extent that we possibly could with the public. So point one is education. Uh, our electorate, our public, needs to understand what fake news is and needs to understand what the Russians did in our, to interfere in our system. There are obvious lessons about securing our, uh, our entire voting apparatus, if you will, as, as what we call critical infrastructure. And certainly from a, a cyber perspective, securing uh, voter registration rolls and uh, voting machines uh, against uh, cyber assaults. So to, the, to me, those two things, those are two lessons, I guess, is, is public education and uh, recognition. The other thing is, and this is, uh, uh, again, not company policy, it's a personal perspective. It's my belief, at least in the United States, that we need an organization that we used to have but did away with called the United States Information Agency. We need an organization like that on steroids to do counter-messaging. That should not be an activity of the intelligence community. It should be separate to convey the counter-message both against Russia or, other, or any, anybody else that interferes in our, our system or as a counter-ISIS. Uh, Message, messaging uh, organization. And that needs to be a fairly a robust uh, organization that has the resources uh, to do this messaging, both foreign and, and domestic. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. I am now going to call uh, Professor Rory Medcalf, the head of our, of our National Security College. And Rory has been the host of uh, Jim Clapper and his visit, and will continue to be here for the next couple of weeks. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor. It's a real, uh, a real pleasure to be here this evening. I think uh, we all came along out of uh, a bit more than idle curiosity, <laughs> although I think uh, Kim, that was certainly the line, uh, the line that uh, we'll, we'll ponder um, as, as we go forward. But look, I think we've been treated and privileged to. Uh, a really important conversation here tonight. Uh, we've heard about the alliance between Australia and the United States, the enduring pillars of that, uh, and the question of uh, really how strong are those pillars and uh, how can they really endure beyond the, uh, the transient occupant of the White House, as we've heard. So we've heard about, I guess, Trump and after. We've taken a tour via Russia and North Korea to think about uh, global and regional security threats and challenges and risks and issues. We haven't heard so much uh, about, uh, about terrorism. We haven't heard so much about some of the other issues that I know uh, that on Jim Clapper's visit here, he's uh, very interested in speaking about as well issues like climate change. We haven't heard a lot about China, but that's, that's had a lot of attention in the Australian policy discourse lately. The, uh, the purpose of an event like tonight, I think, is really core to the mission of ANU, in addition to, uh, to research excellence, in addition to teaching, it's about having an impact on the national policy debate. Uh, and the role of the National Security College is very much, uh, very much in that space. So it's been a real privilege here uh, to, to listen to this evening's exchange and to host and to welcome Jim Clapper to ANU and to the National Security College. And of course, to work, uh, to work with Kim Beasley on these issues. I'd uh, like you all now to join me in, uh, in thanking our speakers. Thank you.